Welcome to the Taylor Guitars from the Factory podcast video podcast. Yeah, we're, we're doing a video podcast. Excited. <laughs> and we're sitting down with Bob Taylor and Andy Powers, master guitar designer at Taylor Guitars. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Thanks Cameron. Nice and to see you. Yeah. yeah you know, person. Have, you been, have you been working, actually? I, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it, I just try to look busy, right? At working least. hard, hardly working, same <laughs> thing. Sometimes. Sometimes. You've got to be careful showing up in front of me because you're always going to like, what are you doing to earn That's this right. living? <laughs> Sometimes uh, in, in the past month or so, Cameron and I will just, I'll see his name pop up on my phone and I'll answer. And the conversation sounds a little like this. I know. I know. We're busy. We're super busy. And it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been fun, challenging uh, during this wild time that we're in right now we've launched more products in the last six months i think in than we did last year at this point almost i mean we are yeah not stopping in fact I mean, it's growing let's face it how much coffee has been consumed in the last six months exactly for real <laughs> yeah. right <laughs> well, there went a cup of coffee and we're and, and we're Man. back with another another gu guitar launch this is with the gt urban ash yeah. Which is, I think for a lot of folks, it's, it's something a lot of people have been waiting for. As I've been, I'm completing my 10 year anniversary at Taylor. And yeah. ever since I've been here, we've heard rumblings of people asking for guitars that looking at this guitar really fits with a, what a lot of people are asking for. So we'd love to get into it and discuss kind of what the thought was, why now to deliver this, uh, this awesome smaller body guitar? Yeah, because we've heard words like, would you guys make a parlor guitar? And then we've also like, would you guys make a, G, a, a GS Mini, but El Cajon, solid wood, nicer stuff? And, yeah. and uh, this answers some of that. And it comes out of Andy's mind. But, 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 but why no? Why, why the whole time we yeah. didn't? That, that's I can now. tell you why. And Andy will agree with me. I can tell you why we didn't make a GS Mini El Cajon. It's not a big enough guitar to be worthy of the expense that we would expend mm -hmm. and and extract from a consumer to make that guitar, you yeah. know, out of solid wood. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be a better guitar. It has to be yeah. a little bit bigger, right? Yeah, I mean that's as far as the guitar itself goes. As far as your question of why now, because we can, because we could. Yeah. It's. It's interesting timing because this was actually something that was sort of set in stone. He was already working on it. It was set in stone last winter. Mm -hmm. And we I had finalized the design. We had finalized what we wanted to try and do. And it's a this particular guitar is a gargantuan effort because everything is new. So it's a guitar. Yeah, it's not new. But yet... As far as going to make it in a production environment, everything is new. Okay. And so it was a we really we can't long rob time one piece coming. Except the tuner. Yeah. I mean, the literally, piece. the tuner is, and like the frets are the only shared thing. And anything. the strap button. Yeah, strap button. <laughs> okay. Okay, the okay, okay. A couple of details. <laughs> no, but really, but it's, really it's starting from the ground. A lot up. is done. Yeah. Um, it was actually, some, it came out of a conversation that Kurt and I had in 2013 or 14 we were kind of just talking around some different ideas and things that that i thought would be fun to make and the idea was we tend to separate guitars into call it full-size guitars because they're they're typical size guitars and then you've got smaller guitars that are we think of as like travel guitars mm -hmm. And there's like this spot in the middle, but that's actually where I want a guitar to be. Yeah. You know, where it's big enough to really be good and small enough to be really comfortable and fun. And so this was something I'd, ha I'd had kicking around for, gosh, what is that, six years? Five, six mm -hmm. or more years now? And so it wasn't until this last winter that it f became formalized and the design was ready because it involves so many different things yeah. and so we'd started to work on it in earnest and then well you know things got a little we'll call it a little rocky there for a while mm -hmm. 
because you know the whole world sort of fell apart. But Just we were able to, we were able to keep working on it. So yeah. now we've, we're ready. We're ready to start building it. So things take the time that they take. And what what was your what was the big approach to it when you Bob say that you know we're we're just not going to be able to make a solid wood GS Mini that's going to be enough value uh, or enough of a change or dis distinct enough? What was your approach well, then? It's, in it's really simple. There are a few times I built solid wood GS Minis. We love that little guitar. Yeah, it's super approachable. It's fun. It's like the people's guitar. It's the guitar for everybody. And We've only made three hundred fifty thousand of them. So, <laughs> wait, Bob. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're still it's the wondering most... if it's going to be successful. <laughs> can you, can <laughs> you say that again? Hold on. I, <laughs> How many? Three hundred fifty thousand. Can you it, believe? It is like, our, our. It's the yeah. most popular in terms of numbers. Um, yeah. Taylor that goes out the door. Right? I mean, yeah. It's such a good guitar. It's so cool. We love the thing. And so naturally, being a guitar maker, we think. Yeah, well, could we make it better? Let's try a solid wood version. I went so far on one occasion, I built a solid wood version that was French polished and put together with hot high glue, like all this kind of stuff built around the shape of a GS Mini just yes. to see what that would do. And when that guitar was all done, I went, you know, if I could change one more thing to make it better, if there was only one more thing I could change, I'd make it a little bigger. Sure. And, and I've got to tell it's you, a, that's how, it's the, as simple that's as how that. the GS Mini came about, because I was trying to hot rod the baby. So okay. we, it was like we wanted to make the baby a, a, a better guitar, better sounding guitar. So before the GS Mini, it was like, try this brace, try that, make it thin, do this, put ports in it, you know, just change the strings, yeah. on and on and on and on. It's like, you know what, let's make it bigger. Right, and so then we drew the GS Mini, and and to and when when I work on design, um, I I like to if I'm working on a shape, I draw it and I go, hmm, okay that's cool, make it bigger, okay that's cool, make it bigger, and or smaller if I'm trying to go that direction, and I, I do two things, I get it to where I think I want it, and then I go too far, oh. and it's like okay that was too far. Now come back to and see so where the line you is. You have to make you have to make the mistake, the design mistake on purpose to find out what is the right shape and size. So the GS Mini, we arrived on it and it, it was a beautiful shape. The other thing I do, and I call it the, your reflection in a store window syndrome, which mm -hmm. is like you're walking down the mall or whatever, and and you look over. You're not thinking about anything. You just look over and you see yourself, but you don't realize it's yourself, and you're like, oh. Yeah. You, you realize it yourself. You suck in your gut. You stand up a little straight. <laughs> right, yeah. And some people, you know, in, in modern marketing terms, call that thin slicing. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you think yeah. instantly when you're not thinking about it? Right. So when it comes to shapes, I've trained myself to notice what I think when I'm not thinking about it. So I'll make a model or a drawing or something hanging in my office, and then I'll just go about my day. And then every once in a while, I walk into my office, and I'm like, I'm not thinking about it, and I notice it, and I've learned to note what I think, which is, I don't know. You know <laughs> so if you're working on a design, Andy can tell you this, you can struggle with the design and go, ah, I think I'm done, but you gotta walk away from it and come back. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the same with a song sometimes. Yeah. Oh, it totally is. You know? It's, I think almost anybody who's doing some sort of creative endeavor, whether it's building a guitar, whether it's making an inlay for a guitar, writing a song, Designing a building, whatever it is, like you get so kind of stuck in the weeds on this thing. You work through it, you work out all the details, and you kind of let it just sit there on your drawing board and then go every now and then glance over and go, hmm, it still kind of irritates me a little. Yeah, sure. That means it's not ready. Or you go, like some of my songwriter friends, they'll write 10 verses in a song. And when they go to actually arrange and record it, you know there's going to be three verses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they're going to go th comb through these 10 verses and go, nope, nope, I want this word from this line. Scrub this thing through until you finally whittle it down. And then you're going to put it there. And every now and then look over at it or you'll try a scratch vocal or something. Go, yeah, that felt right. 
or no, nah, that, that's a little awkward to sing, like the mm -hmm. sounds of this consonant, that word, this syllable or whatever, if they don't match, it's just not it. And so with this, that same thing was at play with this guitar, the GT. I think it's just a truth, and you try. Sometimes you, sometimes yeah. you try, to um, avoid the truth. You're like, I want that baby to sound better, without making it bigger. Right. <laughs> and so that's like what Andy was trying. I'm gonna see if I can make this sound. He he knew before he started. It wasn't like, yeah. It wasn't like, oh, I discovered something new. It has to be bigger. He's like. Yeah, it's got to be bigger. Like I knew it had to be bigger, <laughs> yeah. but I wanted to prove to myself that that hot riding it in El Cajon isn't going to make a difference. Yeah, that it's that's just, just sort of a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, guitars, just like any other any other design, there are some aspects that are just so foundational to what the thing is. Mm -hmm. It's like you could you could take a station wagon, you could put a fast motor in it, you could do all this stuff to it, and you go. It's still a station wagon, man. <laughs> it's like right. not going to corner that well. You know, it's not going to handle that well. If you really want it to go around corners fast, make it shorter. Well, then once you decide that you're going to make it bigger, I mean, that opens up a whole can of worms. Right. How did you know? Um, well, first of all, this is not a GS version of a GS at all. It's not. In fact, no, the proportions the GT are different. is its own shape. So were you inspired by existing larger shapes and then comb, comb that down? Or yeah, how did you actually, that? what a lot of people don't realize with a GS Mini is it's based on a Grand Symphony. That's where the GS in the Mini comes from. Right. It's a smaller version of a Grand Symphony body shape. That set of curves is really unique to itself, and it works really well. This guitar is actually... It's an almost perfectly scaled down version of a GO. Okay, grand so we orchestra. Yeah, so that grand orchestra shape that we we first launched it in 2013. That's why I'd started playing with that shortly after it, which is you take this set of curves that has it every one of these curves is like a relationship to itself. They all have to be a cohesive whole. So the, the out and in curve of the waist and the out of the lower bout, all of those things work together to help create a unique like sonic imprint of what this guitar shape can do. Mm -hmm. Then you can further refine it with the bracing architecture and whatnot. Plus it has to look good. Yeah, it's gotta look That's good. It, yeah. Because if something looks stupid, it is it's it is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree. <laughs> that is the sound <laughs> bite from today's episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something looks stupid, it is stupid. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it, it really is. It really is. Yeah. I, I mean, so, especially with a guitar, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this one, the set of proportions and set of curves is really unique because it's a great sounding shape. And so I resized it to fall in between like a smaller GS Mini. Yeah. And then like a grand concert. So it's actually similar in width to a grand concert, but the set of proportions is totally different. Yeah. Right. So I started with that body shape and went, man, I know this thing's going to sound good. It has a lot going for it. The relationships between all these curves, the waist <laughs> size, the upper bout size, the lower bout size, the length, all this stuff is right. Now let me resize and rescale all the other aspects to it. And I've got this thing that, man, that's going to sound good. And then we take the string length. OK, that's another foundational level design choice. It seems so obvious when you say it aloud, but a lot of times you look at a guitar and you take it for granted that the length of the strings are what they are for a reason. Sure. Most of the time, they, modern guitars live in the world of like 25 inches. It's about 25 inches. You can measure it in millimeters and you go, OK, well, it's a 650 millimeter scale or 660, somewhere around there, one of those kinds of things. And you got much smaller ones. You got much bigger ones. And there's I don't want to have to unpack all the technical reasons why they live, why we live in that range. But there's some practical constraints around it, having to do with the flexibility of the strings, the inharmonicity that you get with strings if you deviate too far from that. But the reality is I wanted a scale length that's a little smaller. Sure. It's just a little smaller. Not 
too much smaller, because then you end up with other problems, but a little bit. How much smaller? It's actually a, a real easy to understand scale length. A lot of players, myself included sometimes, will drop tune, E flat through E flat. Right. Okay. A lot of people sing in those keys easy. So they want to play in those keys easy. They like the tension, like when you slack the strings off a half yeah, step. A little slinkier. The strings are a little slinkier. Right. So I like that feel <clears throat> when I play, but I don't necessarily want it to play E flat through E flat. Right. I want it at concert pitch. So I took a more typical scale length, 25 and a half inches, and I drop tuned it, put a capo at the first fret. That's, the that's what this scale that's length your is. Length. <laughs> yeah. That's your length. That's what this thing is. A little trivia. Um, our friend Zach Brown plays E flat through E flat, but he plays a nylon string guitar. Okay. So when you tune that down to E flat, there's not enough tension on a nylon string guitar for it to even work. Right. So to hook him up, we did the opposite. We didn't put a capo on the first fret. We gave him another fret. We gave him another fret. Uh, so he's got, mm -hmm. what would you call a 15? So no, he has concert it's a 13 pitch fret. tension. It's a 13 fret long scale. 13 fret long scale. Yeah. Got it. So we put a, we That's went to awesome. the nut and we stuck a capo yeah. back behind the nut. <laughs> totally. And we just, we made the neck longer. And okay. Dave are in the next room. It's like, hey, Dave, make this neck longer. Okay. <laughs> he puts it on the wood stretcher and makes it longer. It's amazing. And three days That's later, it's like, That's much easier to follow than like just measurements, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think everybody, uh, everybody kind of double checks whether or not they're saying the right measurement. But I, to your point, yeah. adding or taking away frets, that, that's yeah. huge. That's Every just, single one of those frets, when you push it down, what's left remaining to the bridge is a new fret scale. Uh -huh. right. right. So sidebar conversation. At one point, can we do a video showing this wood stretcher? You've referred <laughs> to this wood stretcher. No, that's the, it's actually a special <laughs> tool that you send the new hire for. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. The Let's iron mark iron. that though. Yeah. We need to do a pod video podcast yeah. on the wood. Stretcher. Go over to 1980 <laughs> building 1980 and uh, get the wood stretcher. <laughs> Get me the wood stretcher. Me. <laughs> they'll send you to the 1940 building and they'll send you to the 1925 building. But to your point, I think in an earlier conversation, when we started, we, we started getting into scale length and you brought up something really interesting because um, when you walk into a guitar store, I think everybody visually starts to try to make sense of all of the different guitars yeah. that are available. And well, so they'll always think, body shape and size is kind of how to approach guitars. But you had mentioned something about that might not be the best way to approach picking out acoustic guitars and that scale length might be. Yeah, yeah, like if you were to broaden your horizon and think of instruments outside the world of guitars, look at pianos. I love piano design, I think it's really fascinating. You don't really pick out a piano based on the size of the box necessarily. It's really the length of the string. Okay. Right. So a piano designer is going to look at the length of the string and go, how much do I have to work with? Now I'll make a box that fits that. Interesting. So you end up with, you know, a giant concert grand piano that has a string length of, you know, nine long. feet. <laughs> yeah. It's big, big, yeah. long strings. And that allows you to do certain things. You make it a little shorter and you go, okay, well, I'm going to give a little bit up, but I'm going to gain this and I can build it. I can construct it this way. And so string length is actually a big musical driver on a, in any design. Mm -hmm. so guitars, we don't tend to consider that as often as we should, maybe as guitar players. So I look at this guitar and go, it's not a travel scale guitar. Right. But it's it's certainly a little shorter than what you're accustomed to because it's like playing the guitar with a capo at the first fret. Got it. You have less string tension. Right. So every note you play feels a little slinkier, even though you're playing at concert pitch. You could use, in this case, we're setting these up with a standard light set, but because of that lower tension, it actually feels like you gauged down a set of strings. Okay. So it feels more like you're playing on like an 11 through 50-ish kind of a set. <clears throat> but yet you still have the kind of volume and power and punch out of a larger string. 
Right. You don't have as much space in between frets. So <clears throat> some of those complicated chords actually become easier to play. Someone with a smaller yeah, range maybe if on you're, their hands. Maybe if you're trying hands. to play something where you're spanning several frets, you can actually do it on this guitar where certain guitars you can't. Wow. It brings your both hands become closer together. Yeah. So it makes it easier to navigate some of the kind of funny wrist positions if you're playing bar chords and whatnot. What the I, whole instrument sits on your lap really unique. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest parts of the GS Mini being so successful is it's such a... Just comfortable. Comfortable, you can just cuddle, and it's just a very intimate guitar. I mean, I can sit back on my couch, and it can fit on, on, on my body, and I can play mm -hmm. it and just relax and not think about it, whereas other guitars, you may have to just kind of position yourself and it seems like this, you're, you're building this for a guitar that's just going to be, you don't yeah. even have to think. You just yeah. Yeah, this one, this one, this one you can cuddle to. It's, 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 <clears throat> it's not as small as a GS Mini, but it's not that much bigger. Yeah. The difference in tone is... Um, it's pretty significant. It, uh, GS Mini, I, if I were to describe its tone, I would say it's fun, it's mm -hmm. legit. Yeah, this tone goes into recording, right? Professionalis professionalism, you know, mm -hmm. high-end guitar tone. So it's, it, it, cross, yeah. it crosses that line. Yeah, and GS Mini is like, it is kind of the people's guitar, you know, and it, there's just so much you can do with it. But I'm going to say that if you play a GS Mini for a long time and you just pick up like a Academy Ten. Uh -huh. You know, which is a bigger guitar. You're like, oh, wow. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's massive. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, like it was interesting this last winter as I was kind of finishing up this design. I'd been building it at uh, kind of in the evenings at, the, at my house shop or building the last versions of it. And right around Christmas time, I played a show with a bunch of songwriter friends. And, you know, it's this big kind of like cast of characters and... We've known each other for years, so it's more like a family get-together. Yeah. But we're playing this show at this little theater, and I think four of the writers, four of the singer, guitar player writers, were playing GS Minis. Yeah, because they work. Because they're just, just more comfortable on that than yeah. they are a Dreadnought or some other big kind of guitar. And yet all of them are kind of going like... You're playing that in a way where you sort of want it to be a little bigger than it is. Yeah. They're, they're it's overplaying just, it just slightly. It's, it's a, like, yeah, if I could just take my board stretcher and stretch it out a little <laughs> bit, yeah. we'd all be a little happier right now. But they're not a they're not about to jump up to a you know, a big jumbo guitar or something because mm -hmm. that's just not appropriate for the mm -hmm. for the way they'll hold and play the guitar. Yeah. And the whole time we were playing that show, I'm thinking, man, I've got the perfect guitar sitting on my bench I, at home. <laughs> I've got... It's just right there. I, I'm lucky enough to be on the team here that gets to seed these guitars with artists beforehand. So we've sent out, we probably sent out north of 20 right now. Mm -hmm. And we have artists. And I've got quotes coming back. I'm going to read a couple. This is from Sarah Nimitz. Um, she said, this guitar is so great because I absolutely love the sound of a huge acoustic, but I'm a tiny person. <laughs> and this fits perfect, it plays fast, and it sounds real. That's a great Awesome. Book, yeah. Right? Then I got a couple of others. I got a couple of others that I won't read because there's a lot of foul language, but the foul <laughs> language is in, in utter happiness. So, <laughs> okay. so uh, I won't swearing. read that. Uh, Chris Those words are like aloha. They yeah. mean, yeah. you know, the total opposite. That's Hello right. and goodbye. Exactly. <laughs> Chris Connolly from the band Saves the Day. Why is this thing so perfect? I can't playing. I can't stop playing it. Like I can't. Uh, Keith Goodwin. Oh my freaking goodness! All caps. <laughs> I've never played a guitar like this in my life. Sweet. So those are the things that we're That's getting. That's great. Back. We're getting back. Um, Nick Vinaglu, who we work with on a regular, he, he asked me a really good question. Um, he does some demos and some content for us, and he's recently done some stuff with the uh, American Dream series, mm -hmm. and now the GT. Both have eucalyptus fretboards. Um, he said, why are these fretboards so stinking fast? 
He feels like they're faster than Ebony. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of small details that'll contribute to that. One of them is the weight factor. One of them is the texture factor. But the reality is it'll feel a little more familiar if you're used to playing an electric guitar. Because a lot of electric guitars have either a rosewood or some rosewood-like fingerboard. <clears throat> yeah. The way that you get around on it, the weight of it, those different aspects, it will tend to feel a little more like an electric guitar. Right. Uh, is the, that's kind of the short version. Yeah. But the, the, what's so great about it is it's, it delivers on that, you know, having a smaller body guitar, but then it delivers the tone that oh everybody wants. And, and getting mm -hmm. into the tone, um, you know, of course, changing the shape was a big part of it, but you also changed the bracing slightly. Um, yeah, more than slightly. <laughs> and I think of all places, this this podcast is where to to just dive where... deep into what is this C class bracing, and I just heard about V class bracing, and, yeah. and how do I reconcile the two? Okay, so can I start by saying that there are no firm rules for things that you make. By that I mean. We make the guitars that we make, and we like the way they sound, and there's not really any good reason for some to make something other than what we love, right? So if we okay. want to make an X-Brace guitar, fine, let's build some X-Brace guitars. We make lots of really cool ones. Right. If we want to build the V-Class guitars, well, sure. There's no one who, has, who is writing our own history for us. So we get to do what we want. Mm -hmm. We get to do and build what we dream up, what we think is really fun. Now, I love the V-Class guitars. I love the way that design works. And this design, in some ways, you could think of as a variant of that okay. concept. But really, it's just borrowing some of the same concepts, the same ba like foundational level qualities that we build into the V-Class are at play here, okay? Those physics are what they are. You have a need for stiffness parallel to the strings that contributes to a long sustaining note. Mm -hmm. You have a need for flexibility, that's what creates volume. Well, in this case, <clears throat> this body is a little smaller than, a, call it a full-size guitar, and that means that there's a unique challenge to getting the, the uh, response over the entire register uniform. Okay. Okay. So we needed a little bit of acoustic trickery so that the whole thing would end up somewhat balanced in the way that we want it to. So it's not a matter of just dropping V-class straight into... No, that We're making smaller V-class. What, what that would do is it reflects the smallness of this guitar. This oh. is a relatively small body, and if I build a V-class version of it, it's cool, it sounds good, but it sounds exactly like that size and shape guitar. That makes sense, okay. Which means, eh, it's not quite as gratifying on the low end as I want it to be. So I started, uh, because I need a deliberately asymmetrical sonic response to make this body sound the way I want it to, I wanted to build a deliberately asymmetrical bracing architecture to deliver that. So this design is a, it's a different design. It's based on a single cantilevered beam, if okay. you want to talk about it in engineering terms. But the reality is, picture a diving board. Yeah. Okay. Now when you have, like you go to a swimming pool that has a diving board, you have maybe one end attached to a set of stairs, you have a pivot point on the other end, and this kind of flexible cantilevered thing out there. Yeah. I wanted to use that basic design to enhance the low end response of this guitar while still delivering the intonation aspects that I love with the V-Class design, the volume, and the upper register linear response. Okay. And so it's a different, um, it's a different mechanism to kind of exaggerate the low end response out of a relatively small guitar. Where is it, I don't know if it's, since this is a video episode, on the guitar itself, where do you want things to be asymmetrical then? 
the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so what happens is this guitar, it's not so much like you, you, like you would take a pencil and draw out certain areas of the guitar and say, oh, the low E natural lives in this part of the top and the it's A not natural. a steel drum. It's uh, not a tune you know. like oh, a steel right, yeah. drum. That's you not know. how it works. You're going to look at all of these resonances stacked on top of each other. It's, for me, the closest picture I still have is looking at the surface of the water. You look mm -hmm. at an ocean like a seascape, if you try and break that seascape down into all of its different wave patterns that make for that what looks like a chaotic surface, it's unbelievably entertaining. Because <laughs> you, you can... You I don't can, think I've reached that point in my beach trips yet, but... <laughs> I've spent a lot of time at the beach, I guess. Maybe too much. If you can't get there on your beach trips, <laughs> I don't know why you're asking them about bracing. <laughs> That's right. We all need to just get more familiar with the water if we're going to yeah, get man. deeper into these guitars. And I know I'm not the first person to study it. I mean, Helmholtz talked, uh, he devoted a big old giant part of his his book back in the 1800s about that yeah but you could look at a seascape and say okay well that's a boat wake that's a localized wind pattern that's a swell pattern from this direction mixing with a, a different timing or a different period of swell pattern from a different direction there's some backwash or reflective wave action from water hitting a bluff and bouncing backwards there's all this stuff if you watch it really closely you can start to decipher these little pieces and identify, oh, that's that's doing this, that's doing that, that's mm. doing that. In fact, Jay, since you're just starting to learn how to surf and you're trying to navigate lineups, that's what you actually need to learn to do that well. This is, is go watch go watch the water a while this is the and you'll see your path through it. I yeah. sent Andy a text. Surfing is the hardest. He writes, just wait. You're riding a band of energy created by a storm thousands of miles away moving through a liquid medium. It's hard to explain, but it's a significant endeavor. <laughs> that's, that's an Andy answer. That, so now I'm gonna give you now I'm gonna give you a Bob answer. We had the, I know, we had the this Andy is what I love having both of you I'm gonna give you explain the, Bob answer. the same thing. Okay, yeah. first of all, you know, I'm sure that Elon Musk could tell you all kinds of esoteric tech about what's actually going on inside that battery and all the things that need to be controlled. But we just buy the car and drive it. <laughs> and like, totally. are so thankful <laughs> that he and his engineers understand it. Yeah. And, I, and this concept um, that I'm gonna talk about for a second was made really clear to me, so obvious. I, I hear things along life and I remember like these things. I might spend a week at doing something and I walk away with like a quote, yeah, right? right. And I was into complicated watches for a really long time because watchmaking is the basis of all machining and production line manufacturing and standardization. In Just fact, the I'll interrupt you there to say that that was the thing that actually started the Industrial Revolution. It is the thing. Because wow. it was the first time that you could convert time into a measurable unit that was smaller than a day. And they had to do it by making clocks, eventually watches. And there's, uh, we could do a podcast just on that. And I've read, <laughs> we need to do it. It's <laughs> unbelievable, right? Yeah. The things that we've learned from that. The whole machine tool industry was yeah. built on the, the back of that. And so there's a company called IWC, they're in Schaffhausen. Um, and they're, they're, they make a very complicated watch that can measure the, the seconds, the minutes. Mm -hmm hours, the days of the week, the days in a month, including which days have 20, 30 days, mm -hmm. 31 days, right. 28 days, which years have a leap year, except for every 100 years when you skip the leap year, the phase of the moon through all that time. It's all done with gears and levers and one stem. Wow. Some of the gears and levers are 4 billion to 1 ratio. And this, I, I went to a, you know, like someone goes to a road show for guitars to learn. I went to a kind of a road show for watches at a dealer. <laughs> yeah. They had this new one. And someone's like, well, how did you think of the complication of this watch? And he says, I just see it in my mind. Uh -huh. So when, an, and that's the best answer anybody ever could have given, right? <laughs> and so I like to follow up that Andy just sees it in his mind. 
these bracing patterns. And sometimes I just relieve every, all the listeners of having to go, okay, wait a minute, uh, what did he say? Cantilevered. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, what's a di diving board? Have? Last time I was on a diving board, I hit my chin on it. I, what's that got to do with the musicality of this thing? So you know what, what you're I mean? saying is trust Andy. Is that what you're saying? What, I, what I'm saying is that some people really know that topic. They know it really well. And guitar players, um, there's something genetic about guitar players. They love a, a lot of guitar players. I've given tours for 45 years. There are people that are like, and where do you, you know, where do you guys age the wood? Where do you, and you guys give tours and you know, yeah. but then there are other people that come to the factory and, and, and they look around and you're like, oh, I can tell already. So you're like, here's where we cut the wood. Here's where we make them shiny. Great. Can we go play some? You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And you're like, tour, <laughs> the tour, that's Let's all they bikes. need of the tour, <laughs> except for the showroom exactly. where they can play some, right? Yeah, yeah. But you talk <laughs> about things they're looking at. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and so also there's this other, idea that when we talk about guitars, we, we tend to go get geeky because people are, we've known about X bracing or fan bracing on classicals forever, almost to where we think that's the only way you can possibly ever make a guitar. Yeah. And anything that you deviate from that must be like when Galileo said that, no, the sun is the center of our solar system right. and, the, and the earth is not. And people are like, what, throw this guy in jail. <laughs> right, you know, we have to put him on house arrest for the rest of his life, right? Yeah, and yeah. and so what's and and they're like, how did you figure that out, standing on planet Earth, and figure out that right. we're moving, not it, right? right? And he could explain it to you, but you go, what? well, he he saw it in his mind through study, through brilliance, through synapses firing, like someone can hear music, like watch Jacob Collier. You know, this musician. Oh, yeah, 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 he's okay. a great player. Okay. If he's going to, when he does a master class and he tells you about harmony and dissonance and yeah. why it works and why it doesn't, I'm just like, this is so interesting. But then when he plays, you're like, whoa, he's using notes together that nobody else uses and, and showing you that they work. Uh, and you're yeah. like, I never heard those notes work before. It's unbelievable. Well, Andy's doing stuff that people haven't done before, and it works. It works really, really beautifully. And so that's like the other side. Uh, so, yeah, there is a, in Andy we trust on this because he's freakishly good at it. He's just, <laughs> I, I'm not good enough at understanding bracing. And I'm going to tell you this. Most luthiers don't understand bracing. W-W-A-P-D. We're going to make bracelets. <laughs> yeah. Now, I might, we might get some haters, you know. Yeah. Um, you hug them, though. And we'll hug the haters. Well, because there's, there's... But most luthiers are like, here's my version of an X brace, and this is what I think yeah, about it. Yeah, because it's the nature of inheriting something, then building on it. Whereas oh, yeah, and I think you're a pro. There's a lot to start with a blank that. slate, standing on a cliff, watching the ocean, and going, I'm going to make a guitar like yeah, this. exactly. It's unusual. You just have a different approach altogether, and I think that's what allows mm -hmm. you to offer these. Because, you know, people are familiar with guitars. They think they can look at a guitar and they think they know what it's going to do. And then what's cool is, especially in the last few models that we've you know, launched, is you've just changed that approach. And, and you can't just judge the guitar by what you're looking at. And let's look at the guitar. This guitar, when we look at it like this, it's good. <laughs> Me and Andy both just, our temperature rises a little bit. The geometry is really, really the, good. The geometry of this guitar, that's the other part of a guitar. Because the geometry stable. has to be stable. It's and well when behaved. we look at this thing, oh my <clears> gosh, you're like, I've never made a guitar that looks that good. You know what's, you know what's interesting? You, we were going to bring up that in our questioning. You know, we, have, we always do some pre-production and we have some notes and we have some topics. But I've heard you say the geometry of this guitar is so incredible. What I think... I've noticed the most though, Bob, is you have had a couple of these guitars in your office and I've caught you playing them more than any other guitar that I've seen since I've worked here. I walk in and you always have a GT in your hand. I'm like, who's playing the guitar? I go over there and it's actually Bob. <laughs> now we can't get him guitar. on camera playing a guitar, <laughs> but I catch you in your office playing. Bob still plays guitar. Well, we like music. <laughs> this is why we got into this in the first place, is because you want a guitar. Well, let's go and build a guitar. Yeah. No, this it's a very direct yeah. mentality that makes you go into that in the first place. So this is a new body shape, a new bracing, a new scale length for new us. New neck. 
new neck. Yeah. Um, the even the and, br- even the bridge is actually scaled appropriately to get the right size and weight. So wow. everything about it, it looks it's like amazing. a kind of a classic Taylor bridge, but it's not. It's unique for this thing. New and wood a newer too. wood. Yeah. It's got a newer wood. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we went out and got brand new wood. <laughs> <laughs> this old wood that everyone's using. <laughs> But, no, we but, went to the wood and, store and got and new wood. The urban ash, which is is a wood that we're finding more and more across the Taylor line. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it started with uh, I believe it was the Builders Edition uh, 324, yeah, and then the American Dream guitars launched with it, and now this uh, this GT urban ash. So, you know, we could this is a shape. It could go. You could make it with lots of different woods. Why did we pick the the urban ash for this first? You know this uh, new shape well a simple answer is because it works really well it does there's Sounds- a guitar reason and there's a supply reason yeah well we can't get urban ash unless it's there to get mm-hmm. and once you decide that it's there to get you better commit or there or no one's going to be interested in getting it for you right right so in order to use it you got to you got to dive in so using it more, and then some pieces are wide and some people's narrow and that kind of stuff. So there's one thing about using wood on guitars is like there's all kinds of wood that you could use to make a guitar of. Can you get it? Right. Right? Can you get the wood? Can it, can it make it from a tree on a corner of, you know, Hollywood and Vine to your bench? Can it make it from a forest to your bench? So there's practicalities of even getting it in the first place. People tend to really concentrate on how does it sound and is it the perfect wood for a guitar and <laughs> will it replace a whatever, you know, that's, but there's, there's so much practicalities to it. There, there are, are so factors. many kinds yeah. of wood that you can use, but you can't get there from here. Right. And so I, I always like to toss the, the practicality and now that we've committed to it, we need to be a good partner to the person who's getting it for us in the first place. Otherwise right. they'll just... We don't need one tree a year. That's not using urban ash. That's <laughs> yeah. not. That's not using it. Yeah. You know. So you have to. You have to come to the plate. If you're gonna. If you're gonna come and and eat at this trough, you better. You know, cookie calls. You better come. You know. <laughs> you, and you better use the stuff because that's what makes. An economy around right. this tree, so that when they get the good logs, they don't go, "Hey, we got another really good log." You know, we cut. You know, it was the the guys identified this one. They had to take it out, and it's one of the mm-hmm. one out of ten that are really good. So we're bringing it into the log guard. Do you, you guys want it? No, nah, we got enough of that. <laughs> we made we made you know hundred guitars, and we got enough of it. <laughs> You're like all of this, man. I got you know, like yeah, the ladies say, I I, yeah, I shaved my legs for this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, right. yeah, so that's totally one thing true. that Andy totally understands. Yeah. But we often don't talk about that, right? Because yeah. we're so we get so embroiled into the guitar the itself, romanticism like, of the like wood, yeah. like there's only some wood in the world that you can make a guitar out of, and we're out trying to discover yeah. those. Yeah. But that being said, is we wouldn't consider urban ash if it weren't an amazing guitar. Well, of course wood. not. It's and we make wouldn't a good consider guitar. it if it were an amazing guitar wood and we couldn't get it. True. Yeah. Absolutely. We wouldn't consider that either. Yeah, that's equally as true. It's it's kind of similar to why we're using, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to use the wood in this case, but we're, lo- we're incorporating this smoked eucalyptus for the bridge and the fingerboard on these guitars. Well, why? Okay, well, we have an ebony mill. We love ebony for fingerboards, yeah. bridges, peghead veneers, like <clears throat> ebony's great. It's fantastic. But so how much can you get? How much can you get? You can't just keep getting well, more and I, more and more. If right. we want to build more guitars in the future, I know the rate that those forests are growing and we're planning like crazy. And so all of that's continuing to go and that's going great, but we but what will likely build more guitars than that could sustainably or responsibly supply us with. Yeah. Okay, well that means that I don't want to stop using this, but I don't necessarily want to increase the pressure on that. Well, we need something else. Let's use something else. What other options are there? Okay, well this I don't want to use because well I can't get it, there's not enough of it, or it would just be creating a new problem somewhere else. Yeah. I don't want to do that. 
Let's look around in our own backyard. What do we have? What can we get? What will work well? What's the right mix of the practical side of, of that supply? You're not going anywhere without practicality. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You're, I mean, just going, you're going, going, you're going what, nowhere. It's part of what determined yeah. the woods we build guitars out of in the first no. place. Yeah, yeah I don't care what car you have. If you don't have a road, you're not going to get there. Yeah. And, the, you know, you, you've got to have practicality. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so awesome. some of those woods, even the, like you point out, the traditional woods, mahogany, was not a traditional guitar wood until it was widely available and right there. And went, hey, this works really good. Let's right. use that for guitars. Yeah, they made, you know, cabinets out of it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it furniture like, oh, wood. It's like, man, Which this... is why, you know, Fender makes Alder and Ash guitars. Yeah, it was available it in was Southern down California. The, it was down the street at a cabinet shop that was getting wow. rid of some extra inventory. <laughs> Let's go get that and <laughs> use that <laughs> make some guitars. Yeah. Well, that's cool. It wasn't invented yet. Well, I, overall, I mean, it's such a, so many new things about this guitar. I know people are going to be itching to <laughs> try them out, play them. Um, we'd love to hear if you have time to, well, I like to playing guitars. play something for us on, on one of these models. One, one more thing. The, the general common comment from all the artists is this is the best smelling guitar <laughs> that really? I've ever yeah is it Andy's, stuck my nose Andy's in. personal uh, cologne there that that smell smell in? no it's the smell of ash that ash really? in particular in combi when you combine it with spruce the two have a very sweet smell okay it's a real pleasant thing actually. so when you check this guitar out in the store yeah. Give it a smell. Give it a smell. Yeah, give it a <laughs> do, you have, do you have a piece of raw ash here that I can hold up on the camera? Yeah. There's a block right there on the floor. Okay, that and then we'll Okay, I'm gonna just share this about a little info about the ash. So here we have, I think the camera can is getting this. Um, yep. this is a this is a block of urban ash. You can see this the outside of the tree. Look at the grain. The grain's uh, wide because this Grows a lot, but the, that one was a porker. It was a porker. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> grew a lot. And as, and and as a matter of fact, this is two pieces glued together, and you can't even see the seam because so it and just we're flows. looking at it, you know, like up, like yeah. A section, right now, it's up roots to leaves going that direction. Yeah. And again, this is one piece, and that's another piece glued to it, and you see a color change, like because it's going from heartwood to sapwood. Yeah. But still, you don't see the joint. So this wood has the weight of mahogany back in the pattern grade mahogany days. It has the same ring. It also, mm -hmm. Andy and I call it the golden retriever of wood because <laughs> it just wants to please you. Yeah. It's not ornery, it dries easy, it cuts easy, bends easy, sands easy, machines easy, everything about it is perfect. Now, people think about ash, if there's woodworkers out there, they're like, oh, that's a heavy wood, you know? Yeah. But this isn't North American East Coast Midwest ash. It's not baseball bat ash. No, it's not okay. baseball bat ash. It's tropical ash. So it actually grows in the same forest that mahogany grows in Central America. We call it urban ash because that wood was brought up to Los Angeles 65, 75 years ago and planted. Everything grows in California because we have every climate that there is. So there have been right. hundreds and hundreds of species planted over the last century and a half in California, and there's all kinds of woods that end up thriving here. So I can't tell you if tropical ash from the tropics is as good a, a guitar wood as tropical ash from Los Angeles, because it's a different environment that yeah. it's growing mm -hmm. in. It's drier, it's not in a forest, it's what we call a field tree. Mm. Now. Uh, people have heard that we bought a bunch of property in Hawaii and we're replanting it in Dakota. In the middle of that, I have a 14-acre stand of planted tropical ash. So okay. an ash tree in Los Angeles, exact same tree, comes up, uh, you know, 15 feet, yeah, you trim and then it turns into clearance. big branches. Yeah. But my ash, since they're planted close together, goes up 45 feet and okay. then looks kind of like a pine tree because they're because it's shaded. Wow. It's a, it's a it's like a forest or a densely planted tree compared to a field tree. It's rained on 80 inches a year in a fairly wet climate in a different kind of soil. And in LA, we have 
arid deserty conditions with water going to it. So the environment is actually going to determine the characteristics of the wood. Even it it's it's it does. We don't know for sure because we're only using the urban trees, the ones that were grown in a city. Yeah. Uh, soon we'll cut one of my trees down from Hawaii because I've got some big ones like this that go way up. And we'll see how it compares to this, having grown in a different climate. So Interesting. anyone who's hearing about urban ash from Taylor, don't think baseball bad ass from uh, wherever, the Midwest, the Northeast. Mm -hmm. It's a different tree altogether. Okay. Um, but it's still ash. And it's, it's also, also not swamp ash. It's also not is, swamp ash, which is like the ultra lightweight, super spongy. It's what you want to build a Telecaster out of. Yeah, and it's it almost like Polonia or in something a swamp. like that. In a right. That's in a like yeah. more more of a sponge or a vegetable than it is wood even. Mm -hmm. Now, how did we find this? We found this by going up and looking at a log yard that one very forward thinking arborist who has the contracts for 300 California municipalities to take care of their trees. He doesn't, he's not taking care of any private property trees. Yeah. We haven't even tapped the trees that are in someone's yard that are gonna get cut down and turned into firewood. Mm -hmm. Just city trees around California. And they decided they're, they're just tired of mulching these so they put together a 20 acre log yard in the East County of Los Angeles. Yeah. And we went up there and looked at logs and it's like, well, that's a stupid log. And, you know, that's firewood and that, whoa, what is this? Yeah. Right? Wait, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, Andy like and I, we walk by logs and we're like, oh, you know, we moonwalk back to them yeah. because <laughs> it's like, stop the truck. What is that piece of wood? That's, so that's how we found that. There's yeah. others we're highly interested in too. Yeah. And there's um, a couple species of eucalyptus that were into this one here and another one that we're testing right now that could be more like ebony. We have to modify their colors, but we can through and through. So awesome. these urban trees, we're not gonna use anything that doesn't have the properties. We bypass the ones that don't have good guitar properties. Mm -hmm. And then if you say, hey, we love this one, can you, the first thing is, can you get it? And they're like, yeah, not so much. And you're like, okay, keep moving. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing to see here. Right. But when those two, there's a nexus point of, yeah. oh yeah, we can probably get one good tree a week for the foreseeable future. And then that's, you know, that's hey, where wait You're like, well, okay, well, wait a minute. Then, then we want to also come in and support and go, we'd like to use one good yeah. tree a week. Right. That right. way we have, we're doing business. Awesome. with that company and our company and our clients and making something really good. And it like Andy talked about earlier, it takes this huge pressure off of expanding the company with the same old stuff right. that you, that A, may get boring, and B, we don't want to hammer a forest trying to get the last tree to make that last guitar. Yeah, that's yeah. not healthy. So anyways, um, that's how this stuff is, and it's just, yeah. and so we tend to color it dark, and yeah. um, we like that, but this is what it looks like naturally, and it's, if you it's could, great wood. You're gonna have I to could make the nicest furniture out of this that you could ever, uh, everything, just like you make the nicest furniture from mahogany, mm -hmm. sure. you make the nicest guitars from mahogany too, so yeah. this is closer to really, really, really good good mahogany that's amazing than almost anything else that yeah it's the closest thing i can compare it to well, you might have some that looks like mahogany right. like african mahogany mm -hmm. uh sapele mm -hmm. but it's not like mahogany right. other than its color yeah absolutely let's mm -hmm. give it a listen yeah sure <laughs>
phones on the whole time, so I cheated <laughs> a little bit. I, I have the answers to the test. Um, but I can tell you, after recording these guitars a handful of times, that this guitar records almost perfect. Uh, it, it's, it's so unbelievably big, yet focused at the same time. It's kind of the best. It, I would go back to that Golden Retriever. Yeah. Right? It's the, or the Goldilocks of guitars. It yeah. is everything that you was need. That, that was our code name that was for the project. Goldilocks. It was, yeah, Goldilocks, the, uh, it was, it was known crap. as the Goldilocks guitar for the longest time <laughs> because no matter how you slice, you go, yeah, that one's kind of just right. And uh, it's, well, it's like the just right of everything. That's it's awesome. unbelievable. I mean, looking for a studio guitar, great. Looking for a guitar on the couch, great. Looking for a guitar to perform with, great. Yeah. I, it's got it all. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with us and sharing the design behind this guitar. It's really fun to have both of you in it. Um, it is. It's, this is a fun guitar. It's a fun group to build it in. It's a fun place. It's really the only place in the world that we could build something like this in. Yeah. And while it's fun to talk about the technicalities of the guitar and the bracing and the woods and all this, the reality is it's a guitar for playing songs. Yeah. You don't need to make it more complicated than that. Yeah. Pick the guitar up play the song if you enjoy playing it that's what it's for that's awesome. so it could be if you don't follow any of the stuff about bracing you don't want to worry about the woods or the this or the that man you don't have to just pick the guitar up and play it they're really good for making music with well um you can check out the gt urban ash at a store near you and uh, yeah thank you so much for watching and listening to the taylor guitars from the factory podcast Thanks, guys.